Well, thanks, Lawrence, and uh, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, when, you, when, when we started talking about it, you asked uh, the best questions I'd ever heard about system change investing, so I thought this guy really gets it. And now that I've gotten to know you and see all that you're doing with your company and, and future capital, I'm, I was kind of amazed. You're like a people magnet. You draw all these people in. and. I know you're a shaman, so maybe you're doing something behind the scenes to facilitate with that. I don't know. <laughs> but um, uh, so anyway, just to uh, pull. But uh, just uh, I just thought of a uh, few ideas about youth that I wanted to just start at start out with because we, that's what we just finished with, and and that is that uh, you know one of the things we can think about is um, how to empower them and how, and how to help them. And about empowerment is to kind of look at how we disempower them and. Um, you know, uh, who is it? Um, the great psychologist Bruce Levine wrote extensively about how uh, vested interests disempower the youth because those are the ones who usually drive uh, revolutions. And, you know, in the 60s and 70s, as Gary was discussing, they drove a lot of change. But as we increase student debt, um, you know, when they're under financial pressure, they're often not able to, um, to you know, follow their hearts. and their passions in psychiatric drugs and competitive education. Um, a lot of, all of these things are really kind of pushing the, the young people down. And one of the, another thing we can do is, um, I think, help them because we don't, I mean, we don't have time for them to grow up and, and fix everything. You know, we're still in power. And they, I think young people can definitely drive change, but it could be two different types of change. One is, uh, uh, collapse and um, revolution which could lead to a lot of suffering and the other one is more of a peaceful transition and that involves kind of helping them to understand what some of the um, key leverage points or key actions needed and what, for example um, right now they're going to um, companies and, and saying uh, you know stop you know lower your carbon emissions and our systems create a situation where companies have to emit carbon and uh, cause other problems. If they don't, they'll die. So when we tell them, get rid of your carbon emissions, we're essentially telling them, them to die, which they can't do. So the real enemy is not the companies or the leaders, it's the economic and political systems that make them, to, that make them emit carbon uh, in the first place and cause other problems. So if we can help them understand that the main solution to climate change isn't doesn't really have to do with climate change or even greenhouse gas emissions. It's the economic and political systems that compel them to emit those gases. And then when they focus there, they also wind up largely resolving all the other major challenges uh, in humanity. So I, I, I would think a youth movement for system change would get to the best way to do climate change and everything else. So that would be an important message, I, I think, to give to them. So Frank, <clears throat> based on that, you know, it's all about messaging, right? So I can kind of get lost in the left brain and analytical side. I remember when we were on um, uh, the, the cliffs up in the fort in Dubrovnik, and you told me something, and I stopped you in your tracks, and I'm like, oh my god, I love that. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot, but it was the washing machine. Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I was when we, um, you know, corporations are obviously incentivized and structured to do a certain thing. So when we ask them to take care of the environment, something they're not structured to do, it's like asking, asking a washing machine to drive you down to the store to pick up some groceries for you. It's just irrational. It's not going to work. So, um, you know, uh, the key. So. One of the, we heard some great presentations about um, uh, from Till and Stefan about specific ways to finance the SDGs. I was going to talk about a whole system approach today and uh, a more of a root cause way uh, to address them, and then tomorrow I'll talk about more specific uh, ways to engage the capital markets in, in addressing uh, the SDGs. So. Um, just to, just to frame it up, um, for many years I was the head of research for the largest company in the world rating corporations on, uh, on sustainability performance, and I saw thousands of, of examples of where companies could make more money by acting more responsibly, but this was always true only up to a point. Beyond a certain point, if they tried to lower their pollution further or take better care of workers, they would put themselves out of business. So it seemed to me that system change, that's a system problem. Companies for, uh, are systems forcing companies to do bad things. It seems system change was about 80% of the problem, getting close to 0% of the attention. 
So I developed a model in 2003 for engaging the capital markets in driving system change uh, by rating companies and developing system change investing funds based on this thing we'd already successfully done with SRI uh, using um, the capital markets to drive companies to engage in, in sustainability. So I, I saw that, um, you know, we've been talking about system change for decades, but it's in many ways it's not working. Our economic and political systems in some ways are getting worse. So I did a lot of research on how to change systems, and, and that's what I was going to basically summarize today and then open up for discussion, a whole system approach to system change. And I thought maybe, Frank, if we ground it in that 80-20, because I think that's really critical and not to be cleaned over too quickly, um, is is the fact that, you know, in, in if we look in the asset management world and we talk about, you know, moving, aligning assets for good, there's a lot of different acronyms that can make you go crazy, but, you know, socially responsible, impact investing, all of that stuff. What we're talking about is using the current system, the system, cur current systems and currency and investment vehicles to be able to get that 20% lift within that current structure. But if we don't get to the systemic aspect of this, then we can't move to the rest of the 80% of that. Yeah, properly. yeah definitely. And, and we can use the current systems. Uh, I mean, if, if we want to, the youth are, go, are going to drive change. Reality always wins. You know, at some point, no matter how much we suppress them, they're going to rebel. The question is, how, what kind of change will they drive? And some of the most powerful, probably the most powerful short-term leverage points is to engage the capital markets in driving system change. So I, di I just wanted to frame up a whole system approach because uh, um, also I, I should probably say Lawrence mentioned the left brain. I, I can easily go, go deeply into the intellectual side, but you know, coming from my heart, the thing that matters to me the most is future generations. So that's, I'm trying to kind of, that's what's driving me with all this. In terms of, um, in terms of, we've been working on economic reform, political reform for decades, but we're getting worse. And I think the main reason for that, as Einstein said, our level of thinking, everything in society reflects our thinking and the, and the actions that come from it, our flawed systems. So a whole system approach involves stepping back and looking at the whole system, looking at the the natural based constraints, uh, the system changes that are needed to abide by that, the actions in different areas of society, and in, in, in our case, what's the corporate role in driving those actions. And one of the, one of the main principles of doing that is, is putting the what before the how. Um, so that, excuse me, that, um, that mostly involves stepping back and looking at the big picture first before we talk about how to achieve it as a way to kind of get beyond the barriers to change. And one way to think about that is to use the analogy of back 200 years ago during the time of slavery, if somebody was talking to someone in a slave-owning society explaining why slavery was no good, they would probably say, you're being naive and idealistic, our whole society is based on this, it, it, could, never, it could never change. And they'd think they'd probably put the idealist, you know, set them straight. But if they had stepped back and looked at the big picture, they'd see that um, slavery violates the natural law of inequality. It's definitely going to end one way or the other, so they'd have to be much more motivated to figure out how to end it in a non-disruptive manner. Um, so in, in, in terms of that, um, you know, when we think about the two sides, the constraints of nature and the upside, the upside is that um, nature is, uh, you know, the implied intelligence of nature is almost infinitely greater than we are, has almost infinite levels of cooperation, coordination, symmetry, technology, prosperity. We're part of nature. You know, we, we, we probably only reached one trillionth of our potential. And the way to get there is to recognize, before we even talk about how to change current, well, the, the, the point I was making about the slavery analogy is that just like people back then couldn't understand a, a society without slavery, many people today, if you spoke to them about our system flaws like limited liability, externalities, time to like money, would right away start explaining to you how it would be impossible to change that because we've lived under those systems our whole lives. We learned about them in school. We depend on them now. It would see, seem, so if you start at that level, you're not gonna get there. One way is to, a way to get beyond that, putting the what before the how, is to step back and look at the big picture. 
nature doesn't care what uh, what humans think, say, or do. There are certain constraints that all life must abide by, and there's natural and non, uh, physical and, and non-physical laws, like physical laws, equitable resource distribution, cooperation, equally valuing current and future generations, seeking balance, not growth, living off of renewable resources, producing no waste, um, no, producing no externalities, uh, decentralized production and government, and letting individuals reach their fullest potential. And then non-physical laws of equality, fairness, um, self-government, and free expression. And these aren't idealistic. These are cons system conditions for life. So for example, if you talk about um, equitable resource distribution, some people would say inequitable distribution is a characteristic of humanity because it's, it's existed for so long, but that's not true. I mean, our bodies take only what they want. Animals t take what they need. Our, our cells in our bodies take only what they need. Animals take only what they need. Um, and, uh, you know, for throughout human history over the past 12,000 years, any society with, uh, with large inequitable resource distribution collapsed after a relatively short period of time. So equitable resource distribution isn't some type of I idealistic uh, philosophy. It's a, it, it absolutely will occur one way or the other. And understanding that, just like with slavery, can incentivize us to step back and say, how can we meet these laws of nature? Then once we have that clear up on the wall, the constraints that we have to abide by, then we can begin to talk about how to achieve that. What are the system changes needed to get there? And one of the system changes that, that when I was um, working on system change and developing models for rating companies on it, uh, there, you know, there are many different economic and political system flaws, and if you took all of them and rolled them up into one overarching system flaw, it's the failure to hold companies fully responsible for negative impacts. That is the mechanism that puts business in conflict with society and creates a situation where if you don't pollute, you die, uh, in many cases. And uh, in competitive markets, companies cannot voluntary, voluntar voluntarily mitigate their impacts and remain in business. So we're all, they're all different. And that brings us back to the 80-20 yeah. discussion. That, that's exactly why the 80-20 exists. It's, it's the, so there's all different forms of that time value of money, externalities, limited liability, overemphasis of uh, economic growth, failure to adequately measure uh, social well-being, allowing regulated entities to strongly influence regulators. Um, and so that seeing that system constraints are, high, are much higher potential than what we have now, the system changes needed to get there, like holding companies responsible. Uh, and then looking at the in, emulating nature is a major principle of sustainability. And in nature, thousands of different things happen and add up to a, a comprehensive solution. So there's no one single answer on how to get to sustainability and achieve the SDGs. Actions needed in all different areas. You could say government, general public, and the corporate financial. Vested interests controlled governments are unlikely to change on their own. Um, the public is the most powerful force in society, not just the youth, but all of us collectively. But as the U.S. founders knew, it's easy to mislead and disempower the people by dividing them into debating factions like conservative and liberal. Uh, so that, that's a, the ultimate main way to drive change, but it's a longer term issue. When the people are divided, the corporate and financial sectors are the most powerful. So engaging them in changing the systems and addressing root causes probably is the most powerful short term. Uh, uh, stress the saying of this is that, you know, the three major areas of action uh, where uh, action needed to drive essential systemic changes are government, general public, and corporate financial. And the, the best short term option is, is uh, engaging the corporate and financial sectors in system change. Because the, the major system change from a corporate and financial perspective is holding companies fully responsible or abiding by the rule of law, which says do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone. Only government can hold companies fully responsible. Um, but they're, they're, they're largely controlled by the corporate and financial sectors who right now use that influence to block change. But if we use the capital markets uh, to begin and begin doing what we did with sustainability, rate companies on system change performance, then we start sending the system change signal from corporate owners to the corporations that you should start working to change systems in ways that incentivize you 
to get rid of your, your negative impacts. Meaning the 80%, they can, companies can generally, and I'm generalizing a lot here, but companies can, on average can get rid of about 20% of their negative impacts on their own. The other 80%, they, if they go into that area, their costs go up and soon they go out of business. So the 80%, getting rid of those impacts, requires changing the economic and political systems that are unintentionally forcing them to do bad things. Nobody intended that our economic and political systems would compel companies to hurt, labor, destroy life support systems, but that's exactly what's happening. It's kind of, the, we, the, we're in the people in the future uh, are gonna look back on what we're doing with not holding companies responsible and all the other system flaws in the same way that we look back on slavery, but we don't see it because like limited liability is, is an example that compels companies to engage in the most risky activities because it specifically doesn't hold the owners responsible. In the future, people would be like, we're not only allowing companies to, to cause harm, we're compelling them to. And that, and that is, in terms of the SDGs, so much of the work is focused on the, uh, the, is the symptoms. The SD, SDGs are uh, there to address environmental, social, and economic problems. And those problems are largely created by flawed systems that put companies in conflict with society, humanity in conflict with nature. We force companies to cause environmental, social, uh, and economic problems. So trying to address the problems, the symptoms over here by specifically addressing the goals without addressing the thing that's creating the need for the goals in the first place is like, is like trying to put out a fire with, uh, with one hand and throwing gasoline on it with the other. We're not gonna get there. And that's the main message that I, I, these kids should really know when we talk about helping them. It's not so much about lowering emissions, it's about changing. Now, wait a minute, I, I shouldn't say it like that. It, it's not either or. Um, in nature, thousands of things happen at, at once and add up to a whole system solution. So all of the specific SDG work is fantastic and we should increase it by a factor of 10. The new work that we need um, is focusing more on economic and political reform. We've been focusing on that for 40 years, but not successfully, I think, because we haven't been using a whole system approach. And so we have some questions here, but I want to make sure before we finish up, Frank, we have the conversation of, okay, how do we really get it done, right? How are we going to drive capital in that area? And I know Frank and I have, are working on this together, actually. So I want to make sure we do come back to that. But, you know, when we look at, I mean, some things are in life are pretty simple when you can look at them from a broader view. Yeah. And all you have to do is look over a history of time and what are the tallest buildings, right? It's not governments anymore and it's not churches. We know who's in power, folks, right? So if we can drive capital to change behavior from the bottom up, we, we get change. And one of my visions is, you know, you have one of the top uh, CEOs down on Wall Street and you can, picture this board behind him and they're all kind of quivering at the at the table and he's looking out the window and he's looking at that company across the street and he goes well why is their stock going up and their cost of capital going down damn it and some brave little soul kind of quivers and looks at him and says well sir it's, it's because they're doing that good stuff <laughs> he says let's do that good stuff too and that's kind of the practical aspect of driving change through capital um, through power, and we'll get to that, but I know there's some questions. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions. So, Elsie, I know you were asking, do you have another uh, you yeah, have a question? I, okay. I know your hand went up first. I'm really bad at choosing who went up first, so yeah. I'll do my best, and Frank, you can help me. So, rating companies on whole system impacts um, reveals where they are contributing to whole system impacts positively or negatively. And investors would then interpret that as, um, well, well uh, risk, unnecessary risk. Is that another externality measure? Or how do we get them to the point where they're, where they're actually um, being held accountable for positive contributions. Okay, let me, let me start and I'll get, get right to you. And so I'll say part of the, is what I was just saying is the fact that when you can drive capital investments and show how those investments are performing at or above market rates and, and you're taking into account the tail risk of, of the uh, behaviors that these corporations are exhibiting that are going to show themselves in stock performance in the future, then you're just doing good analysis and investing and I know it's a much longer conversation 
but that's kind of the start where I'll hand it over to Frank or if you will have something coming back. Just a quick one. Well, so uh, we are presuming there's a correlation between performing well on whole system impacts correct. and performing well as a stop. So, so let me, let Is me, that true? Let me address that one. Uh, I, I would say that it would definitely Very be true. Very important. And, this is the key. And, how, and the reason that, okay, so there's a, a couple of things. Um, I, uh, 20 years ago, I was on Wall Street um, going to the capital markets and saying do uh, SRI because you'll you'll make more money and they're like oh no we'll, we'll make less money if, if we take environmental and social issues into account and we provided very compelling evidence to show that these issues are financially relevant um, so you'll lower risk you'll increase upside potential not only that companies that are smart enough to get involved in sustainability it's maybe the best indicator of superior management which is the number one driver of stock price so in every high impact sector and almost every other sector or we took the list of rank companies, cut it in half, the top half outperformed the bottom half by 300 to 3,000 basis points per year over about any time period. Now in terms of system change, rating companies on system change performance is much more complex than traditional ESG rating. Because ESG rating, environmental social governance, is basically looking at companies' efforts to lower negative impacts by lowering pollution, sell low impact products. The frame of reference is their negative impacts. The frame of reference for system change, if you want it to work, you have to do it from a whole system perspective. So the frame of reference then is the whole earth system uh, and the, 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 the specific objectively necessary system changes needed to align human society with the laws of nature, the action needed in different areas of society. Then once you have that template up on the wall, system constraints, necessary changes, required actions in all areas, then you can ask what's the corporate role in uh, bringing about those change and aspects of that role become metrics in a system change rating model. Now the reason that they, so to go, what we're going to have to do is the same thing we did 20 years ago, make the business case for system change. To sell it to investors, they're going to say, it's not my job to change the economic and political systems, plus I'll lose money. So we have to come back with a very powerful argument that it explains to them, uh, first of all, Companies understand that this is a closed system. The more negative impacts they have, they come back and hurt them more and more as reputation damage. The smart companies know they have to lower impacts and it'll help them in many ways, but they can only go so far. So they're forced to have negative impacts that they know are gonna come and hurt them. The only way to get the ones they can't get unilaterally is to collaboratively work with others on system change. So that's the business case for system and change. And Frank, I'll add, I'll add to that. Some of it is like really, when, when I look at Frank's system, and we've been doing a lot of analysis as we've together been uh, working on building uh, models and funds, is you know some of it on the positive side, forget about the tail risk on the stock analysis for a minute, but on the positive side is just a really good indicator for better governance and management, right? I, I, would I mean, it's, it can be it's kind of that simple, and I, it, I, it isn't that simple, but. That's what I did for many years. I made the model, so I, I've been working on this for, for years. I System change is by far the co most complex management challenge. That means it's the best indicator of management quality, which is the number one indicator of stock price. So I, I have extremely high confidence that we can come up with system change ratings that will produce ad alpha, produce financial outperformance. We can get high financial performance. We also, the market is $23 trillion for SRI over that. We also can make a pretty bulletproof argument that investing in systems or root causes instead of symptoms can provide greater sustainability benefits than any other type of SRI investment. So you get the top sustainability benefits, high financial performance, plus as, uh, as it's known that more, uh, that system change is the most important sustainability uh, issue, companies are gonna have to get involved in it if they wanna maintain their reputation as a sustainability leader. So uh, if financial institutions launching system change investing funds will be seen as the most, the top financial Yeah, leaders. and we'll get to the other questions, but the, really the, the, the punchline on this is that then the paradox is that everybody can be motivated by greed. That's it. Right? I mean, yeah. this, is, this is it. I mean, you don't have to convince anybody any other than... That, 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 that is it, and that, that's how we won at Wall Street. You go, we, we didn't say do this because it'll be good for the environment or, or the bunnies. We, we'd go in there with the hard-nosed financial attitude, you'll make more money. And that's the exact, that's the starting argument for system change. Explain to them why you'll make more money than everything else is gravy. And of course, 
you know, one might ask, why would they change systems that they're currently profiting from? Well, it's not going to have to change overnight, but in the short term, you can profit more. And also, if we help them to understand that these systems, like slavery, are absolutely going to change. We're massively violating the laws of nature. Equitable resource distribution isn't a philosophy. It's a requirement for life. So we're going to get there one way or the other. Once they realize that change is going to happen, they'll see they're much better off rather than fighting it, working to have it happen in a, in a productive way that protects them and society. Yeah, the corporations get a bit of a halo effect, you know, when they're trying to do all the sustainability stuff, you know, on inside, <laughs> right? I, 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 Let's I, look I, at I me. I think this is too facile. I mean, if you look at the empirical history of big systems problems, climate change. Mike, please. Mike. Climate change, tobacco, opioid crisis. Companies realize what they're doing. And they don't go the route that you're talking about. I don't think pushing the greed angle is actually going to make things better. I think uh, we need to be realistic about what the oil companies have done for 40 years about the climate system. Mm -hmm. it, so are you saying they don't realize? I mean, there are documents now that are coming out. Well, what I think what happens, what I saw in overseeing the sustainability analysis of the world's 2,000 largest companies for many years is that uh, there's all kinds of levels of commitment, lots of greenwashing, but once companies realize you can make more money by doing this, a lot of them get involved because you can enhance your reputation and get lots of other benefits. And so they go part of the way there, but they can't go all the way there. One of the reasons they, they resist going further on climate change is because they'll die if they do. And it, that's, that's a system problem, not a company problem. So if we change the system, if we show them these systems, you might be profiting in the short term, but they're causing growing problems for you and society. So you're better off sitting down and working with others, business, government, civil society, because that's the only way we're going to change they're, systems. They're preventing others from changing the system. I mean, and, that's the problem. And, and the reason for that is that they, they are, because they are required to put shareholder returns ahead of everything else, anything that threatens them, like honestly telling the truth, of, the truth about climate change, they are forced by these flawed systems to create harm, to lie, to do all kinds of things. And this system change, especially from a whole system perspective, is the most complex challenge for humanity. There's not going to be any easy answer. But the thing is, we don't need to know all the answers up front. All we need to do, like with sustainability, is just start talking about it, have the conversation. Right now, large companies aren't speaking largely about the need to change the economic and political systems. Some CEOs might, but just get start talking about it. Come together in a group, say, what are the system problems? You know, what, what can we do? What are some baby steps we can take? It might be a 300-step process. We don't have to jump right to step 298. We can certainly do something. And it's one way to think of it is that darkness can't survive in the, right, in the light. Right now, these systems are forcing companies to destroy our life support systems, make 43% of the people in this country unable to meet basic needs, essentially living in poverty. This, it's not working. And, and it's, it's getting worse fast. I want to move it on because um, we've got a lot of questions. And, and just don't forget that we've got trillions of dollars being transferred to women and millennials, and they're not going to have it anymore. So there's a lot of motivation coming from the other side. Uh, go ahead, and then we've got um, Thomas. Gary, uh, Thomas. Kel, Thomas. Maybe you guys, how about we do this? Oh, After you have to do this, please. Go ahead. We have to Microphone. With your vote, can Microphone. 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 Well, it's just. If I've understood that. No, uh, other people have to turn off their microphone, maybe. No, I just, no. That, that battery's bad. Oh. Uh, Shout out, Gary. Anyway, it's enough if you hear me for the moment. And then okay. we so we're going to be doing another session so we don't have to get it all in on this well, one? I think there's a big picture about global system change, which was, was supposed to be this session. Yeah. And then one specific mm -hmm. issue about system change investing, which comes tomorrow. Okay. Uh, if I've understood, I think we've gone to the, the, this one. But the big question is still out there, and I would hope we can spend some more time on it. If you want to do that one, system change investing today, we can change the topic tomorrow. Uh, I can say it's important we give enough room for what is the global system change needed. 
The, the analogy I was going to use at the start, but I, I didn't get around to it, um, uh, was that you know we were we were going to start at a practical level, take off, go very high, get a big picture view, and then come down and almost hit the runway tomorrow, and then land and cruise up to the gate and talk about p very practical strategies for whole system change. So, yeah. So go go. As long as we get to the, as long as we cover both, is okay. Well, the, I, I think the higher level perspective is critical because the, putting the what before the how, we have to understand what abso absolutely. Is, I, I'm not sure that we're really covering the higher perspective. I was going to talk about that. That's. Uh, so, Gary, let me ask a question. What question might we pose to the group to bring us back to that? Well, fun. I mean, I've read your book, so I know some of the issues you've raised. And to, to raise one that's really obvious at the global system level, uh, the whole way the financial markets work and the rewards for short-term speculative investment is a is an underlying factor. You've written about the uh, uh, the, sh the share buybacks. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if we look at the big system. The financial system, which was created initially to support the real economy, because in the mercantile period and in the industrial revolution, we needed to pool capital. Now the capital is being taken away from the real economy to multiply itself. That's a big uh, system question. So I thought it would be worthwhile, whether we're going to solve them all or not, should we be charting out what are the big yeah, I could frame I could frame that up. Uh, I, one way that I would frame it up is to, you know, the, the, the human society currently is a mirror of our thinking. Our problems come from our thinking, and then the flawed systems that result from it. So a whole system pr approach is grounded in consciousness. That's the beginning of everything, uh, and the higher consciousness is whole system thinking. So. From that whole system thinking takes everything into account, realizes we have to abide by the laws of nature, and it, and at that level, uh, root causes, um, barriers to system change, optimal solutions, key leverage points all become obvious. So that if, if you're and, and that, that's the starting point. Once you get down into the details of how do we change this, it can become mind-numbingly complex. So it's important to, to frame it up at a high level with, with whole system thinking. If you're, there's all kinds of uh, systemic problems if you're talking about speculation. The founders of the U.S. were, were except for Hamilton, were strongly against speculation. They, they wanted a decentralized economy based on farming and small businesses. They didn't want the stock market because that, that they, they knew it was just moving money around, not really not creating real value. But that's that's what we evolved to. So you know, and and one might say, oh, our whole system is you're saying get rid of Wall Street. You know, it, when you start having that how conversation, that's like people back then talking about, well, what are you kidding? Get rid of slavery? That's not going to happen. Well, if our if the speculation is causing inequitable resource distribution and all kinds of problems in society, it absolutely will end. It's not clear to us from our current perspective, but if, when we step back and look at the big picture, it's obvious that that's going away, and so many of the other things that we're doing. So once then once you know that and have that nailed up on the wall. Then, you can, then you're ready to have the how conversation about how do we change limited liability. And when somebody says, oh, we wouldn't be able to develop, um, do R&D if we didn't have limited liability, you'd realize that, you'd see that what they're saying without, without meaning to is that we have to continue to harm and maybe kill our children because it would be too difficult or expensive to not do that because that's what limited liability is doing. What are the major systems issues that you think we should consider addressing as part of this movement. How we do it is later, but what's out there? I think the easiest way to, to frame it up is once you get down into the specific economic and political system flaws like time value, money, externalities, limited liability, all the things that fail to hold companies responsible and force them to do bad things, uh, it's important first to frame it up. And the way that I often frame it up is with the rule of law, as I said earlier, which, which says, uh, do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone. It's very simple. You can't debate that. So when we, so right now, our, we're massively violating the rule of law. We not only allow, we force our companies to destroy life support systems, hurt and hurt every other stakeholder. Nobody intends that, but that is the system we're operating under. So the key, the larger issue, the meta issue, the major system change is how do we abide by the rule of law? And that's where we bring all the smart people together and start collaborating and have meetings about 
well, how could we possibly do this? Oh, that's going to be really hard. Hold on. Who says we're not going to hurt children? That's nailed up on the wall. So if we can't, if you can't figure it out, let's find someone else. If it's hard work, harder. If it's expensive, so what? Once companies realize that just that just that they can't block change anymore, then they're going to use their creative potential to figure it out, and it'll wind up being a lot cheaper and faster than we originally thought it would be when they were deceiving us into saying we couldn't change the system. And if we bring in Shiaz, you know, I'll channel her for a minute. A few minutes ago, I mean, you know, how do we begin to start measuring things? Is how the systems get built, right? So who, who made up GDP? And my goodness, wh whoever invented the fact that everything has to grow in order to survive, I mean, we're defining what cancer is. It's no wonder we're in trouble, right? I mean, that's the, those are the systems that she was talking about. If I may, I'd um, like to connect precisely there because I'd like to get back to the 80-20 issue you raised before. Really, what we were saying is that the 80% of change that we need is not going to happen because people cannot, you know, corporations, the finance sector, the sector cannot change their behavior in an environment where to do so would mean to be not non-competitive. So the question really is that to me what that comes down to is a change in the regulatory environment and at the same time it's precisely the corporate and finance sector that would have to drive that because as you said, through lobbying and state capture and all, you know, all that those processes, uh, the political elites really lost a lot of its uh, independence as an independent force. Not all of it, though. And I would be don't don't think there's none there. Yeah. But um, so the, the question is not just you, but everyone in the room who's in, in contact, you know, with this world. I mean. How much appetite is there for regulatory change? Sure, for you know, and asking you know, for it. And I circulated that email uh, uh, to some of you about the, uh, the 19 members of the 0.01% uh, club asking to please tax us. I don't know how much of that is PR. Well, and I'm asking you all, how much appetite is there? But I think the question I'll just add along with that, Thomas, which is implicit in what you're saying, is. You know who regulates right and who's controlling the government today I mean we can we have to be sober about what's going on right and that's <laughs> part of the problem yeah. so. but one of the one of the major uh, vested interest uh, deceptions to try and block change is to say oh so you're talking about an overwhelming burden of regulations aren't you things that stifle business and so this is where putting the what before how uh, before the how comes in so the higher principle isn't regulations it's not causing harm we we hold people responsible for murder assault and robbery it's even more important to hold companies responsible for harm because citizens can voluntarily not kill anyone if there weren't murder laws but companies can't voluntarily stop causing harm if they're not held responsible so the higher principle is that we absolutely must hold them responsible now how we do that um, obviously regulations is going to be a part of it but there are many different ways to do it and there's no, no no one single answer there's all kinds of factors to drive change one major one is working with the public to help them understand how companies right now are forcing companies to cause major problems the reason we need the SDGs is because we're, we're basically saying company pollute destroy our life support systems we're not that's so the higher principle, the rule of law, not cause harm, when somebody says, oh, regulation would be burdensome, what you're effectively saying then is we need to allow companies to continue to cause harm because it would be too expensive to not harm our kids and other people. When you're looking at that, you're like, oh, that's not an acceptable answer. And we've got to, we're, we're going to stop the harm no matter what. We have to do that. Can I jump in here and challenge that? So challenge. this world was built on abuse. The people, the countries, the entities that are rich today were abusive in the past, most of them. Mm -hmm. Everything you say, I completely like do on the values, but I pointed that out first time I spoke this morning, um, holding corporates accountable, but I also talked about trust, right? So my question to you is, You've been doing this for 20 years. Has it worked? Has uh, it been working? What's what's? Because I also see Gary's point and Paul's point, and I've lived in eight countries and 11 cities. 
So I have perspectives which are non-American too. There's also this attitude of, well, you know, go screw yourself, I do whatever I wanted to, uh, which again, I pointed to ego too, uh, on the very onset. So when you look at, even for regulation, the common in that is there's this revolving door between corporates and regulators, same people, who first uh, are regulators, and then once they understand the system, they go abuse it right. in the in, on Wall Street. And then James That's the reality. Talk about that. I wrote my thesis on externalities at Howard Kennedy four years ago. Um, yeah, there's no way to really account for externalities. Mm -hmm. And we're right outside, we're right on, we all walked down K Street on the way here. Well, one, one way I would suggest to, to think of that is that there's all kinds of philosophies and ideas and why this is going to be hard and why that's going to be hard. And once we get down into that level of discussion, it can take a long time and it can be really complex. And to, we don't have a lot of time. You know, we're coming up against a lot of tip, environmental and social tipping points. As I said earlier, we don't have time for the kids to grow up and, and change things. We, we, we're still here. We've, we've got to do it. And uh, so what I'm suggesting, a way to facilitate those types of conversations is to look at the big picture. The, the nature doesn't care about human philosophies or what we think. They're absolute objective I don't standards. think anyone disagrees with you on that fundamental oh, principle. Oh, okay, so, um, but that, that's how you get through the philosophies that you're talking I, about. I, I think it's not working. It, 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 it's definitely not working unless we're talking about doing something new now. I think that conversation will flow beautifully into, a, as Gary was saying, when we get more, you know, drilling in on the on the other one. Um, I wanted to go to Till because he's had his hand up for a while, and be patient, and then to Till and Gil. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a show to me. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is me speaking for myself, not the UN. So there's sort of this underlying hostility toward the liberal world order that I sense, uh, and I mean liberal in the classical sense. Um, I think it's true that you know capitalism is not without its imperfections, and it definitely needs to be harnessed and guided and limited. Um, but it also is very powerful. I mean, when I go to countries and walk down the street and look at what's been created as a result of this incredible invisible force that's been around for a while, it's truly amazing and something that if you had to sit down and try to structure it, it wouldn't happen. So I, th I guess the question is, can, how, do we, how do we direct it better? How do we harness it better? How do we address the huge inequalities, which by the way, yes, are endemic to capitalism, but ebb and flow as a result of policy and regulation. You know, we, we didn't have capitalism redistributed fairly well for quite some time until the 1980s and 90s. So it's not about, I'm afraid if we throw the baby out with the bathwater, we will regret the consequences. So I, I hear what you're saying, and I guess the real question is then how do we make sure that we don't destroy what's good in the effort to try to create something better? Yeah, so that's a great question, and this is also an extension of conversations at Future Capital UN for all of you who are there. We know, you know one of one of the um, one of the issues. So completely, I mean, it's raised m millions from poverty, and, and capitalism is not an evil thing. Um, there are just some systemic issues with that. I think that have to compensate for the lack of consciousness of humans. Right? I mean, that's really kind of, I believe, what we're talking about. And to that end, you know, one of the things that we have discussed and is on uh, one of six significant agendas at this point um, is the, uh, the ability to work with uh, people all over the world to help raise consciousness. Now, you know, we can, that's another long discussion. Um, but when we talk about systems-based approach, I mean, you know, if people realize, when people wake up and realize um, from this, uh, as the shamans will say, this dream, when they wake up and realize that, you know, we are all one, we are all deeply inter interconnected, then it just becomes like breathing. You don't hurt other people and you don't do bad things, even if the system allows you to do that. But we're not there as a species right now, which is part of our problem. So one of the things I just wanted to bring light to that in, in our um, uh, work at the UN uh, is really an initiative to help move that forward. And, and there's precedence for that. Build them. And what they did in Scandinavia, right? And so um, we wouldn't be the first, you know, nation to take lead on that, or wherever we do that. And I, I would add to that that there's it's difficult to kind of uh, speak about these whole system 
um, approaches in a short amount of time because they're so complex they include everything and so sometimes things get um, you know, maybe don't aren't said the right way but there's absolutely no intention here to throw out the baby with the bathwater the goal here is voluntary non-disruptive a beneficial system change so evolution not revolution so the kids can spark it which way is it going to go so that it, and in terms of the um, capitalism the focus probably shouldn't be on, on capitalism although we've got a, a model for sustainable economics in nature you know resource inequality might be an aspect of capitalism that ebbs and flows but the, those are flawed limited human systems and ideas resource inequality is not an aspect of reality or any natural system including the human system that lasts over the long term resource inequality any economic system based on that be it communism socialism capitalism always ends so how can we you know um, in a rational way come together and figure out how to change these things in a non-disruptive manner it's a huge conversation typically humanity hasn't been able to do that whenever uh, systems violate the laws of nature they always change usually by collapsing because it's too difficult to do what we're talking about right now can we be the first generation that comes together and figures out how to improve capitalism although the focus shouldn't be capitalism the focus should be on society actually first nature of which society lives within so for the first requirement is what does nature demand the second one is what's an optimal society, us reaching our fullest potential, then that gives the parameters for a sustainable economic system. So the first conversation should be environment and society. That tells us how to do the economic system. And then a sustainable economic system sets the parameters for a sustainable financial system. That's so right. We have Gil, we have Gil and then oh, a follow up, and then follow Gil, up and then Doug. And that is, I, I think for what you're saying, your premise is that somehow finance, financing can be the thing that changes companies if it's used right. And I guess just from my experience, I find financing that sector to be one of the most resistant to change because it's relatively protected. Um, whereas companies who have to face the market with their products and services are much more susceptible to consumer changes and attitudes. And so I, I thought it was interesting that you think that finance could be a way to drive the change for companies. Yeah. And sometimes I think it's the other way around, because companies are in a more competitive market than financial Well, it's, it's not either or, but the market has been growing way faster than the mainstream. The SRI market, as I mentioned, is over $23 trillion. That's 57% of assets under management in, in, the, uh, in Europe. Um, so it, it's clearly growing, and the reason the financial institutions, all of them, are launching SRI funds is because there's demand for them. The investors want it, one, because they can often make more money with it, and two, because they want to invest in ways that um, are aligned with their values and protect the world that their kids are going to grow up in. That's, that's your business, Lawrence. So, so we've got Gil, we've got Doug, and Mila who? Lloyd. Who? Lloyd. And Lloyd. I got a lot. Okay. And Mike. Thank you. Yes. No, if you, I'm not the end of the line, but I'd like to get in the line. <laughs> okay. I got the mic here. Excellent. Okay. Um, so let me try to make this as compact as I can. So I've been dealing with uh, systems perspective work for almost 50 years, been in conversation with Frank about this work for about 25. Um, and we agree on about 80% and disagree on about 20% take the 80-20. The 20% is kind of coming to a rolling boil here, though. Uh, so let me try to offer that in a way that's most productive. And you know that I love you. And I want to challenge you out of love. Let's hear it. Okay? Um, <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> so, so to say that companies are forced to do this, I think really dishonors the companies that don't. Uh, the companies that have set a different challenge, that have voluntarily decided to dramatically reduce their carbon emissions, zero out their waste, and so forth. If companies are forced to do it, those companies couldn't have done what they've done, yet they have. And I want to honor that initiative in the face of the enormous counter pressure that the market provides against that. Um, you say that, <clears throat> that companies would go out of business doing this. I respectfully disagree. I point not only to, uh, to Raj Sisodia's work, um, but our own work is the work that we have done with companies ranging from, you know, HP to Levi's to Coca-Cola to Avery Dennison, SunPower, and so many others, is specifically about how they can increase profit, reduce risk, 
build brand power, build share value, cement relationships with employees and customers by doing the very things that you're talking about. It's not a cost. And frankly, our biggest challenge over the past 30 years has been the mindset that I'm kind of surprised you're conveying, which is that the general assumption that we find in boardrooms all over the world is, we can't do this, it would cost us profit, when the data is clear that it doesn't necessarily if you do it well. And in the case of one of our clients, their estimate of the value of the opportunities that we identified for them was about equivalent to their total global revenue. And this is not a bullshit company, this is one of the world's best companies that said, even though we're doing so well, we have been blind to value that, frankly, the kind of approach that you're talking about has been able to disclose. So, and then you also said that the SRI funds are growing so well because people are seeing they can make money. And the companies can be more profitable doing this. So kind of with that as background, my, my main concern about this presentation, I've been listening to you for an hour, and I still don't know what you mean by global systems change. What are the changes that you're calling for that you think are better or more powerful than what we've done? You've talked about the rule of law, I'm all for that. Uh, uh, that's good, but you're suggesting something deeply uh, transformative in not just changing the, act, like what you said early on, it's not just changing the behavior of companies, which is what I was just referring to, but changing the system. But I don't have a clue about what you mean about changing the system or how we might do that. To say that it's complex, yes it is, but to say that it's complex and we can't talk about it here leaves me with nothing to go on. Okay. Um, so, so, so I, I, and I don't know, Gary, if that's something we can do today or tomorrow, but I have enormous respect for you, Frank, and for the depth of thinking that you've given to this, but I feel there's something you haven't yet put on the table, and I'm asking you to put that on the table. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for bringing that up. It's another example of how when you take a complex thing and try and say it quickly and simplify it, you, you leave out some important points. So I, I spent many years looking at, at how companies were making more money by doing the right thing and lowering impacts and we were rewarding them by giving them good ratings and they got higher stock prices. Yeah. So absolutely there are many, many cases where highly motivated CEOs with great intentions are doing wonderful things and put, always pushing the envelope and, and there are many, many, many examples where companies were able to fully eliminate a certain type of negative impact because they found a cost effective alternative or they got creative or they, there's, they did under other wonderful and smart things. So I don't mean to take away from that at all. Um, and there's a lot of very smart, successful people like you who are helping companies do that. The thing that, but in, in every case, I don't think you can give me one example of one company that was able to fully mitigate all of its negative environmental, social, tangible and intangible, uh, long-term and short-term negative impacts. It's absolutely impossible. You need synthetic chemicals. A lot of times you need uh, fossil fuels that you can't get rid of. Um, if, if, if you try and pay your employees enough to meet basic needs and your competitors aren't, you do it, you go out of business. There's all kinds of examples. There, I know there are, way, there are many cases where you can push the envelope and solve certain problems, mm -hmm. but there isn't one company that's been able to solve all of them. I, I generally estimated that that's why I estimated the 20, 80 percent. If you take, in, like for example, when a fa factory closes in a small town, um, it often, if it's, they lose 50 percent of their jobs, it can lead to divorce, crime, all kinds sure. of intangible problems that result from that you couldn't really quantify it. So, so let's stipulate that that's true. So what are you proposing as global systems change where we should focus our efforts to open this up and transform it? Okay, so, so I'm gonna make a suggestion. Yeah. Um, it may be unpopular right now, but, I, but um, I was just checking in with Gary too. I think when we drill, and it's so important obviously to drill into what Frank's suggesting here, but I think we're gonna have the ability to do that tomorrow. Um, at well, some we have another session, the two of you. I think you can yes. So, Gil, if that's okay, we could, because it's 5.30 now and I want to just get a couple no, of I, 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 was, I was sort of hoping we could have a kind of high level thing to hang our brains on tonight uh, and then okay. Okay. dream on it and come back in more okay. specifics Let's, tomorrow. So if you could, I mean, can you nutshell this in 90 seconds by what you're calling for? Yeah. Okay, well, essentially, I guess one way that you could summarize it is to think of the way nature
nature works. Um, nature works. It's been here for three billion years. So there are certain implied economic principles there, like I said earlier, equitable resources. No, no, I, I get that, but what would be the global okay. systems change we so, would do to enable so to global, support that? Global system change then is taking what humanity, the process of moving humanity from the way we're living on this planet now, causing all kinds of environmental and social problems unintentionally, and moving us to that sustainable form, all the actions and system changes needed to get there. That's what I spent eight years writing a whole series of books about. I got that much about what the specific changes are. And I could definitely download you at the bottom if you want, but I, I can try and shorthand it more tomorrow. But the basic process is, first of all, nobody has all the answers. I certainly don't. We're not smart enough to do that. But together we can do it. It has to be through collaboration. Right now we're not putting enough attention on it. If corporations start saying, I'm going to improve my reputation, we've got to do this, and they start supporting other groups that are doing system change, like WASP, and we come together, a lot of smart people can begin to figure out what to do. The overarching principle, I think the main one, is the rule of law. That encompasses all of the economic and political systems laws. Very simply, it means hold companies responsible, and when we do that, they make the most money by acting responsibly. How, what the process is for doing that, there's actions needed in all different areas of society, raising public awareness, uniting and empowering the people, ending the war between conservatives and liberals, in the, corporate, in the corporate sector, as a, an experienced rater, what I would do is come up with a model for rating companies on system change. Those metrics become the roadmap. Like when I was at Innovest, a lot of companies would come to us and say, how do we get higher ratings? Because CalPERS and other institutional investors, you want us to have them. We said, here's our list of metrics, do this, that's the roadmap, that's how we become a sustainability leader. The exact same thing happens with system change. Our metrics become a tra training. We teach the corporate sector how to engage in system change. It really depends on what the metrics are, and there's lots of them. I, I could talk about what those are. It's a lot more complex than ESG, but we have to make it simple, too. Can I, so. can I